now, you've seen, seen that one. Um, if you want to stay, we're going to bring some other tanks out for you. So, just a bit of a contrast between how German tank design advanced so quickly in the wartime period. This is an L model, so the Germans use the phrase Ausrum or uh, uh, iteration or mark as it would be called for us. Uh, this is L, they go through the letters. Now this particular model, Panzer III, is quite late in the production run. It's got a five centimeter gun on it, so 50 millimeter, long barreled, anti-tank gun on it. It's got extra armor bolted on the front. Now for the German, and uh, it's been one of those vehicles that's always been a bit of a runner here uh, for most of its history at the museum. You'll see photographs of this running around in a grey colour back from the 1960s. So there it is as a complement, two vehicles, Tiger 1 and the Panzer 3, two running bits of German armour, but also a really good contrast between how far that Tiger, look at the difference in scale there, look at the way um, that suddenly jumped what seems to be. Again, trying to put vehicles in context, this is what Japan did for a tank. Uh, back in the early 1930s. Goes into production in mid-30s, actually keep making them pretty much to the end of the war. This is the Type 95, or the Hargo, the third model, basically, of tank they built. Now this is, uh, again, this Japanese experimentation. So when war comes, they are ready to then throw money at the problem, and they've got prototype systems such as a suspension, such as using the radial aeroplane engine in the back of this vehicle and that 37mm gun. So they put these together in a hurry. It's the British that first use these by going to America before they're in the war saying, can you build tanks for us? And that leads on to the fact that afterwards we end up saying, no, we'll buy into the tanks you're going to make because that makes it simpler. Now after the Grant tank, we then move on very quickly. The Grant basically is an interim vehicle. It has got a howitzer in the hut, a later model suspension on it. Um, and it was a tank that was a hero tank uh, with Brad Pitt at the top and a couple of our guys uh, six months on a film set just north of London. And of course, So this would be called an M4A4 because of that Chrysler. Um, this one's just been restored, so it's in lovely order, and it's painted as a British uh, chassis. It's been used at the end of the war, and I've got an account here. Some of you may know there's a book called Troop Leader by Bill Bellamy, um, and uh, Bellamy was given around, but it's got a different projectile case. They use the brass case from the three-inch anti-aircraft gun. So even quite often people call this like a short 17 pounder, actually it's a very different gun entirely. But it is a high velocity gun. And Britain has now come, what happens with the Centurion, it starts off, you can see that front bit now, we don't have a machine gun put on the glacé plate, uh, so they've got rid of that lovely step frontage to it. Uh, it ends up with a 17 pounder gun where the first ones are made, they are sent out to Germany, they miss the end of the war by a couple of weeks. Uh, Operation Sentry, they're trialled in Germany. Now in 1955, the uh, Bundes... First wave has gone through, another wave will take over. So the idea of the T-72 
it's uh, that Russian philosophy, keep it simple, it's got a diesel engine in the back, very similar to the Willow Ryan or Nader Ryan, and therefore this tank, the Chief Hood, uh, ended up with some of the thickest armour protection of any tank in that post-war period. The Chieftain was fitted with a 